Well, we get into that all-important conversation this morning, and it is a wet morning, it is a sad morning as we discourse on this matter, involving the Tema Newtown uh, shooting incident where um, two people lost their lives. Our brothers lost their lives, and uh, we continue with that discourse as far as the Ghanaian military is concerned and what the way forward is going to be. Joining us in the studio, for starters, we have... Oko Oninku Henry, he is youth spokesperson for the Tema Traditional Council. He is right here in the studio with us. We also have Janet Amu, sister of uh, the deceased, one of the deceased, Christopher Amu. Um, lady, gentlemen, good morning. Good morning, sir. And um, it is only fitting as we start off the conversation to extend our condolences, sincere condolences on this, this loss. I know when you set out marching through the streets of Tema for this festival, you, you, it never occurred to you that you would return with such a situation. Yeah, mm. Thank you. Um, but how best to start the conversation than from starting with what really happened from you two? So let's start with uh, you, Henry, in respect of what happened on the day. Walk us through what happened. Thank you very much. Um, once again, before I, I speak, let me say a very good morning to the Tema Traditional Council and also our condolences once again to the bereaved families and Tema in general. Um, everything happened in my presence. I was part of the procession. The one thing is that when you come to Tema College, Tema College basically means that we are preparing ourselves for the annual Omawa Festival celebration thing. And one thing I want to put across I think when this very issue generated, so many people are saying so many things. Tema doesn't belong to anybody. Tema is this, Tema is that. We want to put it on records that those that kept saying that Nkrumah built Tema. Tema has been in existence before Nkrumah came to the scene in the year 1959. So fast forward, we've been celebrating Pelejo Festival for about 400 years now. And this very celebration, this very year celebration started from 5th April, 6th April and then 7th April. We have done everything we have to do as far as the Kulejo Festival is concerned. And we have some principal streets in Tema. Even if the commander-in-chief of the Ghana Armed Forces stays there, since it's actually a street that leads to our customary rights, we, we, we use those places. And it's a typical street is that the frontage of the Eastern Naval Command where the incident happened. Mm. We have used this place. We have done, I mean, three Kulejos already. We do it, um, I mean, four times. We have done the Sakumo Kuli, that is Friday, we have done Chade Pele, that is Saturday. We have done um, Sakuma Pele on Sunday. And the climax of the whole thing has to do with what we were doing last Friday. And this very incident happened. Like I mentioned, I belong to one of the groups in Tema. Our name is Aiseke. We have another group that is also known as Jamaica. And then these two groups are more like rival groups because we come from different quarters as far as Tema is concerned. Tema is basically a Udu and Ashaman. Though we have seven quarters, but currently as I speak to you now, it has been divided into two. I would do Ashama. So everything we do, whether football, whether Pelejo, the thing looks like rivalry, but then inwardly we know we are, we are one people. So these groups I am talking about, because I belong to one of these groups, the end of Tema Pelejo, in fact, we didn't want anything to happen. And to be precise, in fact, let me just be real. This year's Pelejo has been one of the peaceful Pelejo we have ever witnessed. Because most mm. of the times, after the Pelejo festival, you have people coming in, my car has been broken. My mirror has been broken. And the traditional council sometimes bear the cost. But this year's Pelejo has been one of the most peaceful Pelejo we have ever witnessed until this very unfortunate incident happened on Friday. So we were approaching the military base. And then, I don't know, my group was actually leading. And we saw this Lily branded H200 Toyota Haze. In fact, when you get to their entrance, they have, I don't know how they call it, but then they have these bricks that they have arranged. Maybe something like a, a sun in a sack. They have a sort of barricade. A, a, a sort of barricade. So we were coming from the top there. We realized that this car was actually coming. And then he was just, just like, I don't know if it is speed race or the car was doing. So the youth... So the are, mass, you, are you suggesting the car was speeding? He was speeding. The that, car that was the naval officer. The naval officer. In fact, we didn't even know it was a naval car. I saw Lily branded car. But we went closer to it. In fact, the car stopped instantly because... The crowd actually stopped the car, and the guy started hitting the car because it was between life and death. 
So later on, I approached the guy because I was their leader, and I realized that it's a military um, um, van. One person came out of the okay, car. Okay, so, so let's take the story slowly. In other words, you're saying that the hitting of the car only happened when the naval officers were speeding. Were speeding, exactly. So people were trying we to... We stopped them, exactly. Okay. So after we stopped them, we started hitting the car. And then I approached them and I realized that two military men came from the car. In fact, they had guns on them. So with the, with the gun alone scared my guys and everybody was trying to run somewhere because they felt because they have hit the car, I mean, the military people are going to arrest them. They left. And one guy also came back from came out from the car and was speaking fluent gun with me. I was like, he mentioned my name, future MP. Come on, no, we be a So with future MP, look at what your people have done. So I was like, senior, the way you are speaking fluent gun means that you understand the culture as far as the Kpelejo thing is concerned. Why should you allow the driver to be speeding in our midst this way? And then he replied me, it, it already, um, I mean, we have already done that, but then uh, let's try with a means by which we can settle this. So the two of them that alighted early on have already entered the base because where the incident happened and that of the military base is just like two minutes drive so they have entered the base with their guns i was telling them that in fact my group has already been dispersed but there's another group following the rival group that i mentioned so i will plead with them to drive their car back into the base and later on the driver called my attention to a windscreen that has been broken so i told the driver he's also in a military uniform I said, is, is, is this the Lily branded? The vehicle? Lily branded vehicle. A windscreen had been the wind shattered. Has, has been broken. I mean, a portion of it. A portion of it. Yes. So I told on account of what, what some of fire exactly. Okay. So I was like, don't worry. I am the spokesperson as far as the youth is concerned in Tema Traditional Council. The next morning being Saturday, I'll take you to the Traditional Council. We are going to fix this. We settled that. I think we took about three minutes. We settled this. They respected me and they moved the car back into the base because I wanted the other group to pass. So right after settling that, I went back to the rival group. I, I, I was saying they were following us. And I told them that, my, my bosses, this is what has transpired between my team, Team Aiseke, mm -hmm. and that of the military. So as a matter of agency, I wanted to leave the scene. So I was waiting for the last group, the last person on that lane to leave the scene. All I saw was about six military men with their guns coming out of the military base through their main entrance, and they started arresting, arresting anybody they, 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 they saw. They didn't just arrest them, but they were beating them. Some were having belts, others were using their guns. Just this morning, um, um, yesterday in the evening, one guy came to the traditional council with their jaws rolling because he was part of those that were beaten by the military. Which part of the gun were they using? They were using, I, 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 I can't talk about it, the back of the gun. So the butt? Yes. The butt of the gun. I witnessed everything. They were just beating them, six of them. So I approached this military man, I was like, seniors, I've already spoken with you. Yes, they have broken the screen, which I witnessed, but it was as a result of the overspeeding thing you were doing. I have decided with you, I have discussed with you that I'll go to the traditional council with you, and you are going to fix this. The only thing I heard from one of the military men is that if you don't leave, I'm going to slap, slap you. This guy was in a mask. He if was you, in a mask. Yes. So you can't identify I can't identify this person. So like, if you don't leave, I'm going to slap, slap you. So, you know, the flag we are holding is actually, the one with the flag is just like a contingent commander. Wherever he goes with the flag, we follow. So upon hearing that some people have been captured by the military, the flag automatically turned, the one with the flag turned with the mindset that we are coming to jubilate in the presence of the military base and they will release our guys. So just like, let me say, two minute interval, there was, when you get to their entrance, there's this military guard who is playing a supervisory role, he's at the top. So I heard him loud and clear, be on alert and be on guard, which means that he was actually communicating that to those military men at the entrance. And quickly, I, I don't know if they felt we were actually coming to attack them. We weren't having anything like machetes, we weren't having anything like, like woods or something. And they started, in fact, what I saw, they were, were, they were firing into, into, into the air. Okay, so, so pause there for, for me a bit. You, know, you also know that this is a naval base. Exactly. It's a military installation. Um, you don't enter a military installation under normal circumstances. Civilians, there are some places that are security zones. You don't enter like that. Right. And this was a mammoth crowd. Entering like that could also send the signal. You know that these are military officers. Technically, their training is also in a certain direction. Were you or your people, were you aware of this as you, 
as you went in there? Because though you may not have been holding no, we, anything, we didn't you enter still the base. Mm. So no, there's a street. We, the street is actually a principal street we used. Yes. Right. Yeah. So we and and under no circumstance would even thought of entering the base because you definitely can't you can't it. enter a military base. In fact, you 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 end up being beaten. But had you gone past the road to the entrance point? I mean, their entrance is just by the roadside. And we have other people staying behind the military base. So it is just like a normal route we use. In fact, the, the, the principal street that leads to the only health facility we have in Tema, the Maya Polyclinic, is within that stretch. So everybody uses that place. Mm. So we didn't go with the mindset of attacking the military. In fact, we don't have ammunition on us. But even when we were coming, they started firing indiscriminately, even in, in the air. So quickly, I had to find ways and means by which I can leave the scene. So when my guys also realize that they are firing, they also started, in fact, around that place, we have some gravels and stones around. And they also started throwing stones at the military. So hold for me again. You're saying that the military or the naval officers or whoever started firing first. Exactly. What was supposed to be, were warning supposed to be shots. warning shots. Exactly. And it was only when they had fired that you started throwing stones. Exactly. You, the stone throwing did not start first. Not at all. Mm. Not at all. But, but in throwing the stones, these are people firing bullets. Stones and bullets, you can't. So why were you throwing the stones? So the most serious road, that is when we also expected that even if anything of that sort has happened, I mean, the military, they've been taught conflict resolution and other things. You know how to control crowd, not firing indiscriminately into the crowd. That has resulted in in, in this um, casualties we are seeing. So I even went to the extent of using another alternating route through the Maya Polyclinic to go and calm my guys because at that very instant, I can't be in the middle because the military was here. My guys were also throwing stones. So upon reaching that um, other route I mentioned, the polyclinic route, that I realized that some people are being rushed in there, about three of them. Two of them got there and then the, 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 the lady we met was like, no, these people, their cases are very critical. They should be transported straight to the Temajana Hospital. Another two people had some gunshot wounds and they were being treated. Unfortunately, around 12 a.m., we had the incident that um, two of our, our, our guys have actually been killed. And the most unfortunate part is that one of the diseased persons, I shared water with him probably three minutes after the incident happened. So when I saw his picture, I was quite um, down a bit. So basically, this is what really, really transpired. So you did not see when the, any bullets may have caught some of these people, but all you saw was that two of these people, three of them were being rushed towards you, two in critical condition, as, as later was. Exactly, confirmed. and the one thing is that the moment the firing started, every light within the entrance of that enclave was putting off. Once, military, once the shooting started? Once the shooting started, every light within, even their buildings and everything within that stretch, they have a, um, a sick bay even within that very jurisdiction. Every light around that place went off. So uh, that is when I had to run for my life. Wait, uh, do you know whether it was a power outage? Because it we wasn't are, a power or outage. Or do you feel, and I'm asking for your uh, guesstimate here, that someone from there turned it off? Personally, I, I, I think they, they, they turned it off because that enclave, whilst I was using the polyclinic and th those, those places, I mean, there were lights all over. But the moment the shooting thing started, their lights and everything went off. So you can't even identify that they were shooting this way or that way. But whilst I was there, I saw the shooting in the air. Yeah. At least you saw that they were shooting exactly. into the air. Exactly. Whilst somehow, I was there. Somehow, exactly. some people... Um, uh, th thank you, Henry. Just, just hold for me. Let me also bring in our other guests online uh, yeah. right before we hear from Janet, uh, sister of the deceased. We also have joining the conversation Peter Lanshini Tobu. He's member uh, Interior Committee of Parliament. Uh, uh, Supo, if you are on, please. Uh, okay, so we'll, we'll have him joining the conversation shortly. Also to join, Dr. Nanaya Wakwada, Executive Director, Bureau of Public Safety. And then uh, Dr. Ishmael Nidodu, uh, former UN official in the Sahel. Okay. Uh, gentlemen, a very good morning to you. Thank you for joining the conversation. Thank you. Thank you very much for, for, you for having, having me. All right. Uh, just hold for me briefly. I'm going to hear from the sister uh, of one of the, the deceased as well. And then I'll come to you, gentlemen, with your craving your indulgence. Uh, 
Janet, so let, let me hear from you. Were you part of the procession? No, please. You were not part of yeah, the procession? Yeah, so I actually don't live in Tema, but I was born and bred in Tema. Okay. So my parents are there, my siblings are also there. Now what happened is that uh, my, according to my sister, they had a call late in the night, around 9.30 p.m., that um, already they've already heard that there are some shootings going on in the town. So people were running for their lives and all that. And they, they didn't even think that they, they, their relative was, was part of those who were injured or something like that. Mm. So now when they heard the call, it, because it was circulating on social media, all of a sudden people started seeing pictures. And then they saw my brother and mm. they called my sister that uh, they think what is happening, my brother was also affected. And so my sister called my mom. My mom is... Is, is beyond 70, so you can imagine. And she had to join my sister, and uh, they rushed to the Tema General Hospital. Because I was told that at that point, there were some papers, documents that were supposed to be done that they needed family members. Right. And so it was, it was even a friend of my sister who called her. And so when they got there, they saw my brother um, lying down on um, the stretch, uh, lifeless. And, uh, that is at the hospital? At the hospital. And so they, they tried all they could. They, they saw that no, it was already gone. And uh, people had been there already to, to see to whatever needed to be done. So they went there and saw the body lying down there. But as to what exactly happened, they were not there. It was videos and other stuff that they saw online. Now, my sister took pictures of the body. Okay. And she took pictures of the gunshot right on the chest of my brother. On the chest? On the chest, yes. So he received the gunshot on his chest. And it was small, very, very small. At that moment that the incident happened, my, my brother actually works at the port. So he went to the work and on his way home, you know, this is something that we do almost every year. And so when he was on his way home, he noticed that, okay, today is the last day. Let me just join and then keep fit. So that was what he actually joined. He hadn't even gotten home yet. And then this happened to him. And how did it make you feel when you were told about this and eventually seeing your mother, your sister? I mean, what was the feeling like? It was terrible because my, my dad... Is also around 74, who is a stroke patient. And uh, this, my brother, is the one who takes care of him. You know how, at right. that stage, yeah. the diaper wearing and all those things. So my brother actually is the one who does this for the family. You understand? And so my, my mother couldn't take it. In fact, for those of us who were living out of Tema, they couldn't even tell us the news because they didn't know how we were going to, to take it until in the morning when... when Calls started coming. Of course, it was online, so people started calling us and sending us messages, and then we had to rush to, to go and see my mom. Yeah. And your brother was 38? No, my brother is 40. 40? Yes. Okay, then there is some because the story the said the daily is in the yeah. graphic it, says 30. It's, it's normal, so he was yeah. actually 40. Yeah, I follow him directly, so I know his date of birth. Yeah, yeah. my brother is 40. He turned 40 in February. Mm. And as of now, of course, you say the gunshot wound right before I go to the other guests, but there's no autopsy report. Autopsy is, is going to be done today. Today? Yes, around 9, 9.30 a.m. To confirm? To confirm. What led but to the But per the pictures the that my sister took with her phone, it wasn't knife. I mean, because we saw in the news where the armed forces came up with their statements that hmm. um, those who got injured were gunshots, but those who died were bullets, eh, were a um, knife. Mm. I mean, it, it doesn't work like that. Is it because those people are alive and they can speak for themselves, so they can tell them that, okay, yours is gunshots, but those who are mm. dead, they are gone, and so we can use something against them? No. My sister took pictures, and we have it. I have it on my phone. So this is the sad incident. I'll be going to my guest, but right before I do that, I just want to take a few seconds to read the statement from the Ghana Armed Forces. It is crucial so that we situate the conversation properly with our guests who are technical people. If we can have 
uh, that statement on the screen. But I have it here, and it's dated the 13th of April 2024. It's titled, Attack on Naval Base Tema. And it says, and it's the wording I want us to pay attention to, especially for my guests. A vehicle belonging to the Eastern Naval Command of the Ghana Navy was attacked by a crowd partaking in an ongoing festival at Tema Newtown at about 7.53 p.m. on Friday, leading to the damage of the vehicle. Three of the naval personnel on board the vehicle also sustained, note, severe injuries and were sent to the Tema Naval Base Medical Center for treatment. In the course of the confrontation, three suspects were arrested by the Navy personnel. They were subsequently handed over to the Tema Newtown District Police for further investigations. A mob suspected to be part of the participants in the festivities later attacked the Tema Naval Bas uh, Base with stones and other implements with the aim of releasing their colleagues. At a stage, the security of the base was threatened and in order to protect the sensitive installation in the base, warning shots were fired to repel the attack. It was later reported by the police that two civilians were brought to the Tema Central Hospital dead. The cause of death is yet to be ascertained. Again, on Saturday, 13th April 2024, the mob attacked the Tema Naval Base and the Naval Barracks at Tema Newtown, Beacrow Barracks, leading to the destruction of property. The Ghana Police Service, in collaboration with the Ghana Armed Forces, have commenced investigations into the incident, and it goes on and on. It is signed by E. Agri Kwashi, Brigadier General, Director General of Public uh, Relations, and um, distributed. Let me come to my guests now, and I will start with um, Dr. Akwada uh, on, on this matter, Executive Director, Bureau of Public Safety. Uh, how, how and, and this question goes to both of you gentlemen, what is your appreciation of what happened uh, from the narrative you have known and from what we've heard in the studio? What, what is your understanding of what happened? Uh, very good morning to you and your viewers, and as well as to the panelists. Um, I think, in short, I would say that it, it just shows or gives away um, an armed force or a branch of an armed force that lacks, you know, strategy, um, that does not, is not actually pursuing any strategic objective as far as uh, relations with the community is concerned. And uh, this is not peculiar to only the Neva, um, you know, force, but it's something that we have seen across the general armed forces. Uh, which is not a good sign, especially for our development and for the advancement of our democracy. Moving forward, there is a need for us to take very pragmatic and um, um, bold steps to get our military, uh, if you like, the armed forces, to pursue very strategic objectives that align with the promotion of uh, democratic tenets. Um, let me come to you, Dr. Dodu, then. For you, what story have you heard and what would be your key takeaways from this incident, the, the response from the Ghana Armed Forces, and what you've heard this morning in the studio? Um, thank you very much. Um, and I'd like to um, say good morning to, to viewers. Um, also, uh, I would like to uh, share, share my, send my condolences to the two deceased uh, families. It's such a heartbreaking news. Um, you know, young people are the, are the prime of their, their youth uh, who are truly uh, national assets. Uh, and then you just lose their, their lives uh, tragically. And, and this is quite worrying. Uh, what, what I hear from uh, from talking to different um, stakeholders, and I've had some conversations with some uh, some people in the in the navy and the military side. Uh, I've spoken to some of the traditional authorities and some of the youth groups. Um, in fact, the the, narr the narration that I just heard from the youth leader in the in the Tema uh, traditional uh, council is actually consistent with what I I, I gather around. Um, and so I think that it, it really what happened was um, an issue of indiscipline um, uh, that, uh, you know, perhaps the military uh, gentlemen who were actually in the, in the vehicle uh, 
they don't exercise. Uh, because normally, uh, when these uh, festivals are happening, uh, the, this festival has been happening for, for many years, and uh, the community, Tema community, and the, uh, the neighbor base have actually been in existence for more than three decades. Yeah. Um, and, and so this festival uh, is something that is known, and it, normally it is framed within the ambit of uh, the community security and social cohesion. Uh, it is really nice. In, in, in the past, what we have seen in these festivals that even the naval based uh, command uh, really get involved and in provide the security. They work with the traditional authority to designate uh, the, the areas where they have to do the procession uh, and so on. And so, having, hearing this uh, is, is very, very, very worrying. And in fact, as uh, my other guests said, we, we, are, we, are, we are witnessing uh, a breakdown of indiscipline in the, in the security sector and security forces, particularly the military, uh, in situations where there have been a confrontation between mob attack and uh, with mob attacks. And, and sometimes even the confrontation is, is simply something that they can dispel, uh, but then, uh, you know, for lack of discipline or lack of tactics, uh, they, they, just, they just get into this fray of punishing the citizens. Yeah. One thing that is very striking is why do you have a military covering his face? When have we seen a military personnel covering their, their faces? Uh, we, we believe that the military that we know and normally have a certain decorum in terms of how they dress. Uh, I remember uh, one time I was walking the streets of Accra and I encountered some military who were actually dressed up with, uh, with earrings and, uh, and, and things like this. I mean, this is not the type of military. This is, the type, this is not the type of military that we are used to. And it speaks to a larger issue of the profiling of our military in terms of how it is perceived uh, not just within the regional perspective, but internationally. Uh, it also speaks very well about uh, the, the, the type of military that we have vis-a-vis uh, -vis the standards and decorum that is required for international best practices to the extent that this could be considered uh, uh, within uh, you know, the framework of international uh, uh, security. Uh, strategies for the for, for the region. If you, for example, in UN uh, UN uh, uh, for UN you know military personnel, for example, to be considered and things and, and so on, we have to be very very careful. Um, we are talking about um, development. We are talking about a situation between uh, social cohesion uh, within community that needs to be engendered and fostered by a military personnel. A military entity that has the presence in that particular community. Uh, so I, I, I see uh, this issue as uh, an issue of uh, lack of discipline. Uh, it, it, it's symptomatic of a weak, weak, a breakdown of social cohesion and community security in terms of how our our security entities within communities are, are working together. It also speaks to a certain level of. Uh, anger that is within within you um, of of the perception of of the of the of the naval base. Perhaps they they have been uh, you know things that are happening within the naval base which the community themselves are not very happy about, and these have not been addressed. So uh, you know this whole issue uh, you know just 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 escalated. Uh, having said that, I am aware. That, uh, in fact, I was informed uh, that in authority that when they are they are naval base and they they are in you know, on guard, they normally have live bullets. I was wondering why uh, a live bullet would would be shot rather than a non-lethal weapon uh, used uh, for such a situation. But they, this is the standard practice that they normally have to shoot uh, live bullets, um, and and uh, it is the estimation of the of the guard that the, the mob is attacking a military installation. Uh, and if you are attacking a military installation, then they have the right to dispel you. And I think this is also uh, what, what happened. Is that your reading of the matter? Right before I bring in uh, Superintendent Retired uh, Peter Lanchini Tobu, is that your reading of, of the issue that 
this was an attack because I've spoken to Henry in the studio who speaks for the Tema Traditional Council and he says there was no such thing. They were right at the, the entrance, the entry point. They had not got into, veered into the naval base and in that this is a route they use. So is it your understanding that there was some sort of attack? Because, and I ask that specifically because the statement from the Ghana Armed Forces says there was an attack that some of their members were severely injured and also that they got some of these people and subsequently handed them over, where the suggestion is that they were kept for a while, whether beatings happened or not, we, we cannot confirm, and then taken to, before they were taken uh, to the police station. So I just want your take on that before I move on. Yeah, I, I'm just analyzing this from the circumspective evidence that uh, the, the, you know, the military uh, report have said that there was, they felt that there was an attack. Now we are hearing from the community that there was no attack. I think at the, at the point where the, the guards would have made their decision to shoot live bullets, they would have interpreted it as a threat. And I think that for me is, is what, what, what is concerning. Um, and I, I'll come to how this needs to be addressed because normally uh, before you, you, you get to the point where you start shooting live bullets and, and so on, you have to do a very careful situational analysis. And one of okay. the, uh, right. in order so, to be so, very much aware. Mm, yeah. We'll get to the assessment. I don't want us to jump yes. the gun. We'll get okay. to the assessment of the situation. Uh, Peter Lanshini Tobu, thank you very much for joining the conversation, sir. Can you hear me? Hello, Hello Supo, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Good morning. Good morning. It's, it's good to have you uh, join the conversation. You sit as a member of parliament and... For those who have discussed on this matter, we have um, the PRO for the Tema Traditional Council, the youth spokesperson. We have uh, a sister of one of the deceased. But our other guests, uh, Dr. Akwada of the Bureau of Public Safety and Dr. Dodu, a former UN official, um, they have used words like there was no strategy to what the military did. That's Dr. Akwada. And for Dr. Dodu, there was a lack of discipline and maybe the assessment of the situation where they felt the naval base was under threat has to be looked at. From what you know, what will be your assessment of what happened? Thank you very much. Let me say good morning to our cherished viewers and listeners. What happened in Tema, Newtown, is an embarrassment to all of us as a nation. It's an embarrassment to the security sector of this country. Civil military relations, in other words, civil military cooperation is an old cause that is taught every soldier. The relationship between the naval base and the people of Tama, Newtown, dates back to years. And this marriage has been so strong that they've lived together for years. What happened, if I have the picture very clear, if the picture painted is that during the procession, which is a public event, it's a special event covered by the Public Order Act. During the procession, the police were present to do what they know doing best, providing security for them to enjoy that right. If soldiers come to drive through the crowd, it is expected that there will be some level of scuffle. And if the police were available at the time, they would better advise not to do that. And if it was during this couple, the warning, alleged warning shot was, was, the alleged firing was done and two people lost their lives, I would say that is very unfortunate. The soldiers didn't use discretion. If that is not the case, and it is the case that during the couple, some young men were arrested and sent to the naval base. And the youth went to the naval base to force, to rescue their brothers who were arrested. And the military said they had come to attack the base. If you attack a military base, you are looking for death and not peace. If it is that the youth actually attacked the military base, then we should be saying that they are lucky to have just two people killed. And it's unfortunate. But nobody in this country should attempt attacking a military base for any reason. If the civilian population is well educated enough about security matters, when a soldier arrests you and takes you to a military barracks, run to the police and go and report. The police are in charge of internal security. The soldiers have arrested my brother, they're taken to the naval base, and we don't know what is happening in there. Report to the police. 
The police will know how to handle it. But out of anger, if you attack a military base, you are calling for mayhem. In this country, all of us do know that soldiers do have their role protecting the sovereignty of the state. The police do have their role. So if what happened results in death, I am praying that there will be an independent body to go into this matter. Because the stories are not gelling. What the youth are saying is different. Gandangbo youth are saying something different. The military is saying something different. Somebody independent should stay in the middle and find out what actually happened. What triggered the shooting? And when you talk about the warning shot, a warning shot is not supposed to be fatal. Warning shots are not fatal in character. Warning shots are just the name that they is. It's to warn people not to advance again. But if you give a warning shot and it turns into a fatal shot, what it means is that according to your own training, you have to answer these four questions. Was the force that is used in using lethal force proportional to the resistance? Are you covered by any law to have shot at the time? If you are put before a judicial body, can you account for your actions and be happy? And the last thing, at the time that you are pressing the trigger, was it really necessary? If that was necessary, you should be bold to do it. And I've said this over and over. If you are in uniform and you have a gun, the gun is your friend. It's supposed to protect life and property, including your own life. If there is justification for you to use that gun, please use it confidently and speak about it confidently and let the world know I was right in using the gun. Let's not try to blue veil, let's not try to color anything when a soldier or a police officer shoots. Because the moment you shoot, you'll be held to account for it. And when you shoot with confidence because you are covered by law, say so. If you are wrong, just admit that, yes, this one, we are wrong. But you know what? We need an independent body to go into the matter. So that at least the souls of these two young men can rest in peace. And if the military will have to do something about their men, we open up and let them do something about their men. Because military barriers used to be very far away from town. Today we are living together. The military itself is changing. The society rules and regulations are changing. And as they change, we have to understand that the national security blueprint puts it very clearly. Youth unemployment is the greatest security threat to this country. So anytime you see young people gathered and they are in sense, it doesn't matter whose uniform you are wearing. You should apply your sick brain, not the British force. Crushing them is never an answer in any situation in a democracy like ours. Could the situation have been handled better? And I come from this angle. You've already taken the wind out of my sail by talking about a proportional response, which I have spoken of. Uh, some say that, you know, our police force or our police service used to be a police force. That tag was changed and things gradually are simmering down. But with the rest of them, the armed forces, the military, the Navy and the Red, they still retain that force tag in there. And some say it gives them some idea of wanting to use a show of force. Of course, if you look at what the police has to do vis-a-vis -vis what the military does. There are differences. But is that orientation in itself a problem? And I don't see how, by the way. If you fire warning shots, they go into the air. The PRO, the, the youth spokesperson says he saw some of those. How that ends up hitting someone purportedly in the chest, I do not know, as Janet here uh, uh, suggests. W what is your reading of that? Thank you very much. Until we have access to the autopsy report, you wouldn't be able to state for a fact that a bullet hit somebody's chest. Mm. The autopsy report will give us clarity. That's what I'm calling for, detailed investigation. The autopsy report will give us clarity the cause of death of the two young people. If they died out of bullet wounds, then we we'll ask, how were they shot? Were they shot from behind or were they shot from the front? And the position of a warning shot is always 90 degrees with your muzzle pointing upward. If you have to do that, so I am saying that if you have to shoot, shoot with confidence. If it's a warning shot, do it right. Warning shots do not kill. Warning shots are not fatal. If it's expected to be fatal, do it and know that you are covered by law. And it is the last resort. Using the weapon is the last resort with all the graduated force that you have access to. Every step that you take, the weapon is the last resort. And the moment you grab your weapon and you want to press the trigger, all the questions that are in your brain are answered. This force I am applying is proportional to the resistance. My life is even at, at risk. My life is at risk, and if I don't use this weapon, I may even die. 
And you don't carry a weapon and stand and somebody else will shoot you and kill you. No. Probably the mob was rowdy or the youth were rowdy and probably they were destroying property and even harming and killing people. When you use a weapon, you use it and you are justified. Whatever it is, at any point you are using the weapon, be confident in yourself that, look, I am using it, or I am going to be held accountable, and I will confidently say it because I am covered by law. If you are a soldier or a police and you shoot, and you want to be covered, you don't, you don't want to come out clean. It means that you knew you were wrong. If you are not wrong and you are covered by law, why are you carrying the gun? How many Ghanaians are carrying those guns? You are given the gun because you have the right to hold that gun, and there are rules and regulations governing the use of the gun. So when you are covered by rules and regulations and you are supposed to use the gun, use it with confidence. Don't be afraid. If you are afraid, it means that you are wrong. And if you are wrong, just come clear and say, this one, we got it wrong. It's simple. Um, just my final question to you on this, on this particular batch. I will definitely come to you. But uh, per the law, you know, usually we'll talk about the reasonable man in, in, in a certain action. What would the reasonable man do? Think, right? Yeah. Uh, the crowd was processing, and this is not the first time. In fact, per the uh, youth spokesperson, this is the third one, the Quelejo, that they are having within you know, a space of, of time. And they do that. It's been going on. Once the naval officers were driving through, or the military officers were driving through, at some speed, and it's a crowd, what would the expectations have been in terms of a reaction? And, and the, the other bit... Now, if the naval base was indeed attacked, as per the statement of the Ghana Armed Forces, would it justify the use of brute force, which has now led to these two deaths? Uh, two quick questions, and then I'll go to the other guests and then come into the studio as well. Thank you very much. If the military installation was attacked by the youth, the military are trained to defend that property with all the zeal in them. Attacking the military property is not just the attack of the military property, it's attacking the gun armed forces. And if civilians begin to attack the armed forces, the army is trained to deal with combatants. They are not trained to deal with civilians. But if civilians are changing their color to the point that they can go and attack a military installation, you are calling for mayhem, and even, they will not pay you. Just clarify, so, even, uh, if, even if these purported... Uh, Combatants, because they are civilians, they don't have arms. All they have are maybe the worst case scenario, they have stones. Um, I just wanted to draw your attention to that before you proceed. Yes, I am saying that whether you, are, you don't have anything in your hand, you are armless, you are looking harmless, whatever it is, the psychology behind you attacking a military facility should never be part of our culture. Let's move away from that. Mm. Because our military has a very high international reputation. And sometimes when we push them to the point that, excuse me, they misconduct themselves, it gives the country a very negative image. When we talk about military brutality, let's also talk about civilian responsibility. Both of us, both of us must create the armed forces that we want. If the military is wrong, let's tell them they face this is wrong. If you have an irresponsible group of people, let's also tell them this your behavior is also wrong. Because two wrongs do not make a right. And that is why the police stays in the middle. I am saying that if you have a problem with the military and you are brutalized, don't go to them, go to the police and go and report. The police are the mandate to investigate everybody, including the soldiers. And this we must know as a people. So what is happening? This festival that has come, please, it is not going to be the last one. It's been happening. The police were there. Let me give you a very short example. I have participated in a festival procession like that. A young man took away my beret. I was wearing the beret. He took it away from me. But we didn't go chasing and slapping people. All we did was to get their ring leaders, and they finally got my bread back. And we still had a smile in our faces, because that is policing. In that mood, when the youth are charged, it's a festival, it has a culture, you have to understand them. They are not there to harm anybody. But, you know, when there are disagreements and you don't understand the culture of the procession, you can actually create mess and it will turn violent. What happened should be investigated, what happened should be kept, and we should ensure that it, doesn't have, it, it never happens again in our history. It is embarrassing for all of us as a people. Yes, but on the point of the reasonable man and, I mean, speeding through the crowd, I, I pose that question yes, first. I, uh, I, once, once you're going at no, a certain speed through a crowd like that, what would you expect? It is recklessness for you to see a procession and drive through it 
irrespective of which uniform you are wearing. Surprisingly for me, the police were there. And if they had consulted, if the military had consulted the police, can we go through this crowd? The police would have allowed them to stay away from the crowd just for a few minutes, and they would still clear the way for them to pass. It is not right to be aggressive driving through the crowd. You are, in fact, you are becoming provocative. And when you become provocative, it just shows power. And when you do show of power, in the next one, we also have group think, because the whole crowd is there like a group. When you have a group think and they can also react, it can only end up with violence. The best thing we can do as a country as we speak is to ensure that anything of this nature, we should be talking about de-escalation. We should not create a situation that can escalate tensions and escalate violence because people are frustrated. The young people in this country are very frustrated and we need to handle them with care. Well, thank you, uh, Peter Lanchini Tobu. Just hold, hold for me. The studio, just to clarify a number of matters. So, in this instance, I, some of the youth, they were taken to the naval, naval base right, right the and kept, kept there for a while before they were taken because the statement says subsequently, it doesn't mention they were taken to the naval base, but it says that subsequently, which suggests that something may have happened, and then they were taken to the police. Who, how many people were taken into the naval base, if any, and what happened to them? I think in my presence, I saw six people because the, the military men that came out, there were actually six people, and everybody, I mean, grabbed somebody. So in my presence, I saw about six people that have been um, arrested. And like so I said, it's about six officers uh, grabbing six, six people, people and taking them exactly. into the base. And in fact, no, clarify, into, into the, base. the base. Into the base. So even at the entrance of the base, you could hear them shouting, screaming, hey, you are, hey, boy. So I, I, I felt uncomfortable because. In other words, they are beating us, they are exactly. killing us. They are killing us. So I approached one military person, I was like, Master, if you don't leave me, I will slap, slap you. So that is when I had to step back. So they were beating them. Just yesterday, one guy came, one of the victims, and then the jaw is swollen. He had bandage all over. The traditional counselor had to give him money, and I had to escort him to, 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 to the general hospital. So, I mean, they were just beating us anyhow. And like the um, security experts mentioned, we live with them. In fact, they are friends in the community. Yeah, Personally, I have two tenants who are military personnel in my, my own apartment. So we, in fact, we live with them. We drink with them. We do everything with them in the community. And one, one beautiful part is that the police were all over. You see them driving, but then the police will stop. Even when they have their sirens on, they will stop. They will stop. We will pass. And they will continue. So we were living with them. And... Let me commend the district commander of the Ghana Police Service, Tema Mahia, to represent Mr. Eke and his men. They were, they were, they were so lively on the ground. They, they have been with us. And it, it was beautiful. Like I mentioned, this is not the first time we are, we are celebrating the Collegial Festival. And this very incident will never stop us from celebrating our annual Collegial Festival. And hopefully this will not lead to any frosty relations between you and not, the not military. We know the military the plays a very pivotal role as far as security in Ghana and everywhere is concerned. Now, when you come to Tema, we are giving them a vast land because we know what they are doing for, for the nation. They are built crew barracks. I don't know if you've been there. Look at, I mean, the portion of land that the traditional council willingly gave it out. So we don't have any frictions with them. Like I mentioned, I have two tenants who are military personnel. We have indigenous who are also in the service. So we prioritize the kind of work they do. But for you to and direct our, our, our celebrations. And one unfortunate thing is that I know some of them are bearing gun names, others have Akan names, and they go back to their communities. They celebrate their festival. So what we are saying is that they should never underrate our festival. They should never intimidate us as far as our festivals are concerned because we preserved those lands before they have gotten whatever they have now. And I hope as you are saying it as spokesperson for the youth, it, it has simmered down, that the youth also understand it as you understand it, so that there will not be any further you know, escalation of, of this. Exactly. You, are, you are doing that, right? Yes, we have had several meetings with them. Just even this morning, around 9 a.m., we are meeting them again at the Thurman Traditional Council because some of them were of the view that, yes, we live with them in the community. We would also try to do whatever we want to do with them. But personally, we have had... So some, of, some of them are thinking of reprisals. That is exactly what somebody had. So... We, we have called them, we have met them several, and those of us that we are used, that we are opinion leaders within the community, both from the political um, um, divide, we are meeting them. Let me commend the Member of Parliament for Tema East Constituency, Honorable Isaac Ashao Damten, the Mayor of Tema, Honorable Yuani Amashite, the Regional Minister Designate, Honorable Daneni Kwateta Tegluva, 
They have all put in aside their political affiliations. They have come together, and we are solving this very issue. And one beautiful thing is that both of them took part in the Pelagio Festival, so they know what we do as far as the Pelagio Festival is concerned. Janet, and, and I know it is tough talking about this, but the truth must be spoken so that we all get to know what really happened. Yeah. You've already mentioned to me that the autopsy will take place today. Today, yeah. At 9.30 a.m. Yeah, 9.30 a.m. Um, do you have family members who will be there yes. to observe? Yes, to get yes, yes. So family members are there and they are going to observe. But I mean, we live in Ghana and now you can't even trust. There are trust issues. Uh, we are there just are trust hoping. Issues? Yeah, there are trust issues. I mean, there are trust issues. Mm. So we're just praying that um, nobody will alter anything. It will be just as it is, and then we'll go in there and then do it, and the, the truth will come on. But I, I, like I told you earlier, my sister took pictures, and it's just a small hole on the chest. Mm. Where, and my where brother, you I know, think, yeah, where that you is what, yes, yeah. that something could have penetrated. Something could have penetrated, Because yeah. then we have to leave the experts to, uh, to come through yeah. with whatever yeah. ballistic yeah. But, report. But like, like I'm, I'm telling you, we, we, we still uh, want the truth to come out. Nobody should cover up for anybody because a life has been lost. Why do you think there could be a cover-up? Why, why would that be something that would easily spring to your mind? Yeah, because um, even when the autopsy hadn't been done, I already saw in, 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 on social media the armed forces already saying that it wasn't gunshot when it has not even been done. Right. So once you even do that ahead of the autopsy, it means that you're already defending your people. People were on duty that day, and they need to stand up for whatever they did. They need to come out, and then they need to accept, take responsibility of their mistake. But if you come out even before the autopsy saying that those who got injured were gunshot, but those who died were out of a knife stabbing and all that, it means that already you are defending your people. And that is where we are thinking that something could go wrong. Mm. 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 So which family members are going to be there today? Just to clarify. Yeah, my sister is going to be there and then my cousins are also going to your be there. Your cousins are going to yeah. be there. Of course, your mom is already, you said 70. Yeah. This run around is not, is not the she best can, option for yeah. her. And your father, whom you say has suffered a stroke and this 40 year old, your brother, he does was taking care of him. My, my, my does dad. he know what is happening? He, he knows because people keep coming to the house. We have the minister coming around, we have the mayor coming around, we have people. And then my brother, some way, somehow, everybody knows very him popular. in the town. Yeah, very, he's very, very popular. popular, yes. And so people are coming around and where he works and, and all that. He was also born and bred in the town. So you can imagine, my, we can't hide it from him. Has that affected him? Very, very much, yeah. Let, let me also get back to, uh, our guests as we wind down on this uh, end of the conversation. I'll, I'll start with you, Dr. Dodu. Having listened to all the ends, uh, the loose ends, the autopsy today at 9.30, uh, what the military has said, what the family and the youth group have, have said, what Peter Lanshini Tobu, who has been in, in the service, the police service, has said, what would be your reflections on what the way forward should be? I think you are the one who made mention of an... Um, uh, a group to conduct this investigation that is not aligned. But what would your expectations be moving forward on that point? Right. Um, thank you very much. I would I'd like to underscore again that uh, this is a very sad situation and listen to the sister of the deceased and uh, talking about the, the impact of this sudden and tragic death on the family, especially the, the, the father and the mother and, the, in, you know, and even the community is quite... Um, and disheartening, uh, and I, I will express my condolences again. I think what is important to do is to uh, do a, a couple of things. Uh, the military is beginning to lose um, its its uh, reputation, so they might they may have to do some reputational damage. Um, listening to the issues that um, have been raised by the families and by uh, the, the member of the interior committee who was actually uh, on the service, 
uh, really tells gives gives the uh, the impression that uh, the military uh, perhaps in their statement they are not being very uh, truthful in in what had come out. So then, if that is the impression that is being left in the minds of of the citizens, uh, it's a very very uh, uh, damaging reputa reputationally for, for the military. So they need to really deal with that. The second, the military needs to make sure that there's a real accountability. Uh, those who were involved in, in this incident, those who started it, the one who was driving through the, the, the procession, um, and then the, the, those who actually shot the, the guns and uh, what what went into their uh, you know judgment in terms of why they have to use little weapons. Uh, and did they actually shot a gun? Uh, you know, it was a warning shot, or they were aiming at individuals to kill them. Um, all these things need to be addressed. The second aspect is also the issue around discipline. Uh, we have seen time and time again that these issues is is happening, to, uh, you know, too often, and it's, it's even to the extent that it's becoming an existential existential threat. Um, uh, to, to the peace and security of our country. Where citizens don't feel safe, where citizens feel that um, if they are, you know, uh, somebody who is in the security sector actually um, unjustly kill them or, or do something to them, they don't even have uh, justice. It is a, it's a very bad situation because he really reflects on the overall rule of law uh, of the nation. And that leads into, uh, you know, some you know, issues around social cohesion. Uh, with with modernization of everything, and there's an urbanization happening in the capital, you are likely to have military installations spreading in, into communities where they, they were not uh, before. And so there must be a way for the security sector to be able to to manage their social, uh, social cohesion issues with the communities. And I think something like this uh, should be an opportunity for the military to really sit down with the traditional authorities and, and, and really try to address the issues very well and come out with a set of standards or decorum of how they would, they would be able to work together and live together uh, with the people. Uh, the final thing I wanted to say is we are, we are going into elections. Now, when citizens begin to have this perception of the, the highest form of security apparatus, which is the armed forces, to the extent that they cannot trust it. Uh, and then we do have issues around our policing and their capacity and how citizens don't feel much more trusting of the police compared to the, to the military. Uh, and you are having that at the highest level of trusting the security apparatus is being um, the confidence being being destroyed, then citizens will be very very worried in in the wake of elections because they will be thinking, what if, what if, and that's very very dangerous uh, for our democracy. So it is very very important that we take really lessons from this issue, and the military reassure uh, the the nation that they are bringing, you know, they 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 are making sure that people are going to be held accountable. And they are holding themselves to the highest standards that we know of them. Uh, we, as a final, but my last point is this, I also have a feeling that there are miscreants who are emerging in the security sector that we need to deal with. I don't know how these days recruitment is, is happening, but there seem to be a, a certain level of politicization of the, of the security sector uh, to the extent that uh, you know, political parties see it as an avenue for creating jobs for some of their boys. And so you have individuals who go into these, whether in the military, the Navy or the immigration or whatever, who, who don't feel that because of the way they were recruited, uh, they, are, they have to, you know, subject themselves to the tenets, the decorum and the standards of the, of the, of the, of the choice of the sector they've been put to. So in other words, they have people in high places, so they don't even respect command. Now, uh, these things is what brings out, brings about some of these issues where uh, a military, I can't even imagine a military person uh, of, the, of the standard that we, are, we, are, we, we hold them to drive through 
a procession such as that. What were you thinking? I mean, as a disciplined armed force personnel, you would never even think about that. So if they will have that confidence to be, be misbehaving in this way, I think that the issue of the recruitment and how they feel uh, untouchable within the command is something that, that is coming out and is coming as a result of the right. heavy politicization of, um, of that security sector. And that's right. very, very worrying and concerning to the nation. Thank you so much, Dr. Dodu. Uh, for you, Dr. Akwada, before I take uh, Peter Lanchini Tobu and then we wrap in the studio, Dr. Akwada. Uh, thank you. Um, I think I would like to uh, look at three things. One, um, <clears throat> Dr. Dodu mentioned um, somewhere along the line, he mentioned something that was symptomatic of a breakdown of discipline. Um, one, we need to look at the leadership, both at the political level and at the institutional level. The kind of breakdown we are seeing in the last couple of years in discipline and the lack of professionalism, which is a... Hello, Dr. Akwada. Dr. Akwada, can you hear me? Okay. It appears we've lost uh, Dr. Akwada. If we're able to get him back uh, shortly... Uh, we'll... the, which is... Yeah, which is... Hello? Am I... I'm back? You're back. Please go ahead. Okay. Yeah, which is out there is largely due to weak political and institutional leadership. We need to get leadership to be tactical in their approach and to be very deliberate with the armed forces. If we don't and we, we you know, uh, dilly-dally with it, we'll be witnessing more of such. Number two, our armed forces must pursue strategic objectives, objectives of um, you know, cultural understanding, wherever we find ourselves. We need to pursue aspects of security cooperation with the citizenry. And we also need to continually have community engagement. If these things were there and we're pursuing them strategically, All right, uh, Dr. Akwada, I, I think the connection is not uh, very helpful on this matter. But uh, uh, Peter Tobu, your, your final comments on this matter. We're going to have another conversation with you, but on this matter, what would be your concluding comments, please? Thank you very much. Let me convey my heartfelt condolences to the Brit family and also to congratulate the youth of Tema Newtown. Uh, the poster of the youth from yesterday up to this morning is quite encouraging, and I will encourage them to continue to hold it, because the relationship between the people of Tema and the naval, and the naval base, in other words, the relationship between the people of Tema and the Ghana Armed Forces can never go frosty for more than 24 hours. Whatever happened, we are going to investigate it, and the truth will come out, and they should, they should remain calm, because these are things, it, it's just like a family, husband and wife, once in a while something will happen, and this is the first time that it has happened, so let's not heighten it too much, one thing that excites me most is the fact that uh, Lieutenant General Thomas Opon Prepra is the Chief of Defense Staff. He's an armor man, and this is the first challenge that I'm throwing to him. He should activate civil military cooperation to the highest level, because the military is changing, and they're living with amongst us. It's not like those days that the military barracks is very far away from town. Lieutenant General Thomas Opon Prepra, I encourage you, let this be a trigger that will activate your sense of commitment to ensure that the relationship between the gun armed forces and the civilian population is, is, is better. Um, Dr. Dodu made a point of the emergence of miscreants in our security services. It's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a key point. It's, it's, it's relevant. And we should be very careful not to politicize, political, politicize recruitment. I have made a point this morning about the Honorable Minister for Interior making a public statement that he has told the IGP that they were coming out with a supplementary special recommendation list for the police college where officers are trained to become senior police officers. And I said that is a no-no for a politician who is responsible for policy attempting to go into operation and administration. That is absolutely wrong. And that is the point that Dr. Godu made. I think let's, 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 let's look at it critically. But um, this is a matter that has come. We all have to investigate the matter. And let's clearly 
ensure that we nip it in the back. It should never, ever happen because it can give the country a huge debt. All right. Peter, just, just hold for me uh, just a minute and then we're gone. Just to conclude with you briefly in about 30 seconds each. Janet, Janet okay, so what's your concluding? I mean, I, um, what I want to say is that once we come to the end of this matter, uh, we want justice. Uh, my brother has left five kids behind and a wife. Uh, you know this day and age, even taking care of your own kids, how it is. And so um, once this matter is settled, we want the... Um, the authorities to take a look at that again for the family. Yeah. All right. uh, for you, Henry. Yeah, thank you very much. I think I will still um, seek for justice for these people because if things like this keeps happening, I mean, at last August, we were actually celebrating Homo War Festival. We had similar incidents right. from the Ghana Port and Abbas authorities. Up to now, the, there hasn't been any official report that shows that we were at fault or even the security agency was at fault. But one thing we want the security agencies to know is that they are there to protect us. We have given them everything they want, lands and accommodation and everything. They should make sure they prioritize whatever we do. Now, to end my submission, I once again want to say that the other family, if I we lost two people, the other person is also a very young man, and um, it, it, the whole thing shouldn't look as if we are only talking about my, my friend, Ajay. Yes. There's also, also Joseph yes, Ajay. Exactly. Right. We, are, we, are, we are speaking for both, and we are seeking for justice for those two people. All right. Thank you so much. Um, Henry, uh, Oko Oninku Henry is youth spokesperson for the Tema Traditional Council. We also had the sister of one of the deceased, 40-year-old uh, Christopher Amu, that is Janet Amu. And then uh, we had Dr. Nayao Akwada, Executive Director, Bureau of Public Safety. Dr. Ishmael Nindo, the former UN official in the Sahel. And uh, one who is staying with us, Superintendent Retired Peter Lanchini Tobu. He will stay with us. We'll be right back after a brief break to take a look at the CID boss issue and the court ordering uh, that arrest. We'll be right back. Stay with us.